let me welcome uh, today's uh, keynote speaker the next keynote speaker professor kvl subramanian so before i hand over the mic to professor let me give a brief introduction about sir professor kvl subramanian is currently a professor in the department of civil engineering at iit delhi he is the dean planning and development at iit hyderabad, so IIT hyderabad uh, and oversaw the construction of the campus prior to joining iit hyderabad he was a professor and cattle research fellow in the department of civil engineering at groove school engineering city college of new york dr subramanian obtained uh, btec in civil engineering from uh, civil uh, engineering from iit delhi and phd in structural engineering and materials from northwestern university everston dr subramanian was awarded the early career award from national science foundation of usa he received the james instrument award from american concrete institute in 1999 for his research work on non destructive evaluation of concrete he was the chairman uh, committee 215 on fetic concrete fetic of concrete of aci in 2009 he was elected a fellow of american concrete institute for notable contributions in concrete materials he is a life member of indian concrete institute he was elected a fellow of the indian national academy of engineers in 2021 so with this brief introduction let me welcome uh, professor kvl sir to deliver his talk on nano modifications for enhanced performance of binders focused on cnt and nano silica thank you uh, good afternoon to everyone this is the uh, post lunch session it's um, tough for me i can only imagine it's harder for you so but i'll try to keep you entertained and uh, for the next half an hour that i have been allotted um first of all i'd um, really like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to present at a conference that's honoring my guru professor batacharji the person who taught me construction materials uh, probably it is in my third semester course so um, if i know or if i do not know concrete well that's his fault or <laughs> he takes the credit whichever way it goes so um so starting off now um i i chose a topic that uh, on nano modifications um and i want to stress this fact that i, I i'll talk about binders binders would include a broader plethora of uh, cement uh, of uh, um <clears throat> materials that can be used to make concrete in addition to what we call ordinary portland cement now the background uh, uh, for this and the other thing is um, i am also in i've included clay in there i'll talk uh, specifically about nano clay and uh, it is finding its way into construction now so i'll i'll basically talk about all three materials uh, and how we're using these nano materials for enhancing the performance of concrete so the underlined word is performance a little bit of uh, back background here <clears throat> um right now we are we have a huge problem in india if you look at our projected demand for cement in, in 2050 and we consider business as usual model we are looking at 750 million tons of cement per uh, per year and current production uh, has us at around 200 or 250 and we we are going to scale it up if we want to produce the infrastructure there are a lot of problems resource limitation we don't have enough limestone to produce the kind of cement that we want okay. cement is an energy intensive material we'll talk about carbon footprint it is the second or third largest anthropogenic contributor uh, uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so um <coughs> there we realize these challenges we realize these uh, um difficulties and here in lies the opportunity so um probably uh, we in india have seriously started looking at reducing clinker factor more than any other country and today we do find cements with clinker factors of 50% being allowed by the code being allowed for structural use and that has been possible because we have consistently done research on our fly ash slag and we are able to basically produce ppc psc and they are commercially available this does not happen in in other countries europe or us uh, included <clears throat> there are of course newer binders that are coming into the market all with promise potential uh, lc3 which is mentioned which is basically calcined clay um, which uh, again operates at a clinker factor of around 50% but then there's a whole set of new binders we have which are which are broadly called alkali activated materials the term geopolymers is misused in that con uh, context it's basically these are all alkali activated material depending on the source you could end up with a geopolymer or you could end up with something known as calcium aluminum silicate hydride which is basically a csh calcium silicate hydride with aluminum substitution in it 
So <coughs> the, basically when you're talking about binders, this is the broad uh, spectrum of binders that we have available to us. And within the alkali activated materials, the, the choice is, is actually growing by the minute. Now, oh, sorry. <coughs> so what is the concrete construction in the future going to look like? And if you have to survive the next 50 years, make concrete structures, this is what we have to do. We have to make concrete responsive to the requirement. And whatever our requirements, we have to get into the habit of lean construction. That means we have to do more with less, and uh, which means effective material utilization. Currently, there's a lot of wastage in the material ut utilization. We are very wasteful in the way that we produce concrete, the way we uh, use concrete. That has to go. Um, we have to look at alternate binders. There's no way around it. We cannot make all the structures we want with OPC. Tailored delivery and placement. That means we have to have efficient construction procedures. Um, and efficiency will become the buzzword, whether it is in the form of new construction technology, like 3D printing that is on the horizon. We are all talking about lean construction. That is elements that are lighter. We place material where it is required, efficient structural forms. And then, of course, the final thing is ensure performance in service. So once I put a structure in place, it should give me lasting performance. And so durability and long life become important. And all of these things are being acknowledged. So these are the challenges that we're looking at. And if you look at the um, material performance uh, 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 and look at good getting it to use, we are, uh, it was mentioned in the morning session, performance-based design is coming to the fore. So gone are the days where we look at prescriptive measures. That is M30, M40 grade. I think we have to toss that out of the window. We have to expect performance from a concrete. And performance from the concrete, from a material perspective, in, now includes things like formability. If we are to uh, deliver on this promise of uh, 3D concrete printing, we have to be able to form the material the way we want. Placement and speed, I have to be able to place it fast and deliver a structure faster. Long-term durability, once it's in place, then it has to so, you know, withstand the rigors of whatever the environment throws at it. So these are <coughs> from a material perspective. And of course, uh, performance-based design is also taking its uh, place in structural design, where basically in earthquake design now, they're talking about performance-based design being included in earthquake and wind design. That's already happening. So um, even in the material forum now, we have to talk about performance from the material. Um, just to give you an idea about performance-based requirements, this is a performance-based requirement that was put in place 10 years ago. This is the one World Trade Center, the one building that replaced the twin towers that fell. Um, and look at the specifications for concrete that are put in place. Hopefully that is clear. Yeah, so the contractor was required to produce concrete of 80 or 90 megapascal compressive strength using only 236 kgs of cement per cubic meter. Those of us who made concrete would probably win at it because that is a, a low number of cement, but it was accomplished. And of course, then a lot of other things had to be done in addition to using just plain cement to produce the concrete. <clears throat> then there were requirements of pumping. So concrete had to be, whatever concrete you produce had to be pumpable and uh, concrete had to be pumpable for 15 floors if it is a 95 MPA concrete and the 80 MPA concrete had to be pumpable for 40 floors. So these were performance requirements put in place. The contractor was also held responsible for temperature rise. The so maximum temperature rise could not exceed 70 degrees Celsius. So these are performance requirements that now will come to the fore where we will expect concrete to deliver even in the fresh state as it is being placed. What do I expect from it? So how do I deliver on the performance? So if I have to deliver on the performance requirements, here's a laundry list of what I would require. That is, I would, I would want to be able to tailor the flow behavior of concrete. I want it to flow exactly the way I want. If it is self-leveling, it should level itself, level by itself. If it is for a printing application, it should hold its shape, allow buildability. So that is something I should be able to engineer in the material. Of course, concrete will be proportioned for strength. We are engineers, we're going to build a structure, strength becomes a parameter. But it is only one parameter out of several. Then durability, I have to account for durability. And that is ge geography specific, location specific. I have to identify the parameters and design my mix to deliver performance against the whatever environment throws at it. Low maintenance, whatever I make should look like new even after 50 years without maintenance. That means I have to build it well and it should have some capacity to look fresh without uh, uh, undergoing say biological attack or acid attack or changing climate. And all this has to be done at a low cost. And no matter what we do, if we start pumping up the price of concrete, there are no takers for it. So these are our performance requirements, even cost comes in. And uh, basic combinatrix, the way I was taught concrete uh, by my guru, that is not going to work. And we were just having a discussion a few minutes back uh, that even now, probably, if we followed the Indian code, it's not going to work. The basic combinatrix of cement, water, and aggregate is just not going to do it. 
We have to look at, uh, we have to revisit our mixed design. We have to look at concepts of packing, multi-scale concepts. So we have to look at building the material ground up. Start at the nanoscale, build up the material. And we have to bring in additives and performance enhancers, admixtures. Without that, there's no way we'll achieve any of these performance targets. So going to the very smallest of additives, the nano additives. So here's a whole list of nano additives that you have. I've only highlighted three of those. And if you look at the <coughs> additives, the nano, so-called nano additives, and look at the span, the range, you go from 0.1 nanometer on the, uh, on the extreme left to about um, 10 millimeters, so you're way out of the nanometer scale. But these are all the different additives that are added in there. And just to give you, uh, the pointer works, uh, just to give you a, a, a reference, Somewhere in the pointer is not working. But you can uh, probably identify the CSH over there. It's about one nanometer scale. So just to give you an idea of, of the scale. Now, if you look at uh, nano silica, nano clay, carbon nanotubes, these are basically in the same size range as your CSH. So if I look at CNT or the carbon nanotubes, the advantage is then I can start reinforcing the material at that scale if done right. Nano silica and uh, nano clays, these can fundamentally alter things at the scale of CSH. So that is uh, the advantage of these things. And of course, um, um, what we call the micro uh, scale basically is what you see within the, uh, the red box that I've drawn over there. So first, let me talk about nano clays. Now, what we're finding very exciting about nano clays is in rheology control. Rheology is entering into concrete design, mixed designs in a very, very big way. How do I control rheology? Specific properties of flow behavior of concrete, how do I control those? Those can only be done by using additives. Of course, we are all familiar with super plasticizers, we are familiar with viscosity mo modifying admixtures, but there's still a little bit more that I need to do, and I'll present about that in the next uh, few slides. Montmorillonite, this is something I learned in ge geotechnical engineering. It's a very, very sticky clay, and uh, the geotechnical engineers hate it. It has a very large expansive coefficient. But if you actually drill down into it, it's, uh, it has a very large surface area. It's um, a plate-like structure, and it's an excellent thixotropic agent. It basically is used for thickening up uh, uh, solutions. In fact, um, the cough syrups and a lot of the syrups that we take have a small amount of no uh, modernite in it, because it gives it that thickening effect that you desire. So, we are looking at an application of extrusion-based 3D printing. This is now the new um, technology that has caught everybody's fancy. And the whole point here is that I can build a structure one layer at a time. So you give me an AutoCAD drawing, I, I, I take a structure, slice it into layers, and then assemble the whole structure one layer at a time. What is the requirement of the material? Well, the requirement of the material to meet, uh, to be able to um, uh, be printable, it's the famous triad, as I call it. The triad is, the material should be pumpable. I should be able to pump it out of uh, using conventional pumping systems. It should go through the no it should go through a hose. It should come out of the nozzle without choking the nozzle, and that means it has to have fundamentally low viscosity, and it cannot phase separate under pressure. So I cannot have water segregating out. So when you pressurize a system that contains water, water will have a ten tendency to squirt out. So I have to keep the, the mixture homogeneous. The second requirement is what we call printability and shape retention. And that is, uh, once the material comes out of the nozzle, it should keep its shape. And that requires the material should have a high yield stress. So the liquid ha should have this resistance to flow, and that should be high. And the third most important parameter, so first and second parameters are managed, because when we uh, look at uh, conventional pumping, we typically play with uh, pumpability and uh, dot printability, but certainly we play with the yield stress. Third one is the most critical one, the buildability, is where I have to be able to stack layers one, up, one after another in a matter of seconds. So the layer buildup takes place in seconds. So this is way before any setting behavior takes place. So this has to happen. Internally, the material should structure it. It should develop a structure that is able to sustain the weight of additional layers as I start placing more layers on it. So whatever layer I have deposited should be able to carry more the weight of additional layers on top before setting starts, before any chemical action starts. So that means internally I have to kick the material uh, and should develop some kind of a scaffold inside that can sustain the additional weight. And that is the property of thixotropy. So I need thixotropy, I need to engineer thixotropy in the material to be able to achieve buildability. If I don't, you can, uh, I mean, the photograph is not very clear, unfortunately. You see that uh, on the very back of this um, printed uh, layers that we've shown, you see that the shape is retained. As we come forward, where the buildability was lost, the layer starts collapsing. So that's what happens. So 
Now, um, so we took on the challenge of uh, uh, developing 3D printable alkali activated binders. So it is not bad enough that we are not dealing with cements. We started looking at printing these, this, these particular alkali activated materials. And what is an alkali activated material that we chose? Fly ash and slag with sodium hydroxide and sodium silicate. Now this is a typical alkali activated material. Sodium silicate is an external source of silica that we add in there. And the graph that you see shows you what happens to compressive strength if I keep on increasing the dose of external silica in the system. If I increase external silica, I gain in strength. So the math is very simple. I want more strength, I dope more silica into my activating solution. But here's what happens when I add silica. So this is the um, measurement, a typical yield stress measurement, which you do use in a, in a um, rheometer. We've used a vein tool. So what you do is you insert this vein so that looks like that uh, windmill kind of a thing that you insert into the liquid. You shear it. You basically turn to sp try to sp uh, turn the spindle, and as you're as you're turning it, you try to measure the resistance that the, the spindle takes, and that is plotted as stress versus time. And what you see in the dotted black line with silica content zero is that the resistance builds up. And what that means is, up to a certain finite resistance, the material doesn't flow. It just doesn't flow. And it's only once you cross the hump and you come to the flat line that it starts flowing. So that means the material actually does behave like a solid initially. Uh, of course, the, the stress is very, very small. It's about six or seven pascals. That's all, that's all the stress it can take. But it can take a stress. And I have to overcome the stress to get the material to flow. And I start adding silica into it. So when I go to silica content of 0 0.09, you see the yield stress drops, which means that now I can get it to flow with easier effort which is kind of bad for me because I want a higher yield stress for it to keep its shape. But if I add more silica, something more disastrous happens, and that is it transforms into something known as a Maxwell fluid behavior. A Maxwell fluid is a, 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 a material that continuously deforms, so it's not going to keep its shape no matter what we do. So <clears throat> there's something else that silica does, and that is it kills my thixotropy. So you see the line on the top. So what we measured is called SRE, the Structural Rebuilding Energy. If a material is thixotropic, the SRE, the structural rebuilding energy, will be very high. Because suppose I shear the liquid, I bring it to rest, and then I see what, how much effort would it take for me to disrupt the structure again. That is a measure of SRE. Higher the SRE, more thixotropic the material. So after I've got it to flow, after I've sheared it, if it comes to rest, it then quickly reassembles itself, and it's able to take on external stress. Higher the SRE, that means, it is basically more thixotropic. And what you see with the green line, with a very little amount of silica, is that the SRE, which is basically the structural rebuilding that is taking place as a function of time, is good. The minute I add silica into it, which, is, which I need for strength, the SRE drops. That means the material is not rebuilding from the inside. So if I deposit the material, it's not building the structure inside. I cannot put another layer on top of it. So this material is a very challenging material binder for me to work with, especially from a printing application. Here's where rheology control comes in, and these nanoclays come into play. These, the Montmirilonite, nanomontmirilonite, is an excellent exotropic material. When it's at rest, it basically flocculates. It creates a skeleton inside the fluid. Now, when I shear it, the platelets basically separate out, and the, the, uh, the material starts flowing. If I bring it back to rest again, again the, the, the platelets reassemble and they create a skeleton inside that allows us to uh, add more structure to it. So we basically use this um, uh, nanoclay now uh, to modify the rheology. And what you see, I show you the silica zero, which is the baseline mix. Uh, when I added silica to it, you see that the yield stress dropped. The minute I add a little bit of nanoclay, you see that the yield stress of the material goes, which means that now when I try to print it, it will keep its shape much better. And um, <clears throat> if I go further, this is how I can further uh, improve the yield stress. So well, you can see the stress versus time response with different quantities of nanoclay in there. If I just add, like, say, about 0.05% nanoclay, I start getting very serious amount of uh, yield stress. So yield stress of about 200, 220 is considered to be a material that is excellent for shape retention. Now, this is a material, if I extrude from a nozzle, will beautifully keep its shape. It'll not, uh, the shape of whatever shape I give it, it'll keep that shape. And I can further also measure the thixotropy. So the way we measure thixotropy is uh, using a rheometer. We completely disrupt the structure. So we shear off the material completely at a very high speed, let it rest for some time, and then we see how much resistance it gives us. And we do that after different rest periods. So we can see how the structure is building up as a function of time. 
And what I'm showing you here is uh, when I add about 0.35% nano clay in there, you can see that the static yield stress also starts increasing as a function of time. So I'm actually able to engineer the thixotropy as well. So now I can control my yield stress and thixotropy just with little bit of dosage of nano clay into the system. And this is nanomont merylonite. So this gives me a handle on rheology control. Very small quantity of this nanomaterial gives me the desired rheology for achieving this. And um, so basically now, rheology control with admixtures, of course I use other admixtures, I have to use some uh, water reducer, but clays are now uh, an inherent part of our printing um, uh, repertoire because we basically need control of thixotropy, we need low viscosity, we need high yield stress. And I can do this by playing with my water reducer and clay content in the mixture. And of course, when we're talking about printing, a lot of effort goes into packing. So we have to pack our solids properly. We also have to look at microfines. And we can basically achieve a buildability like this. I'll show you in just one minute. This is a, a wall that we printed one meter in height. Basically, we were able to assemble different layers and print in a one continuous stretch a wall of about one meter height, which is considered quite a good achievement, um, considering the fact that we are printing with a material that is absolutely uh, printer unfriendly. I mean, this is something that is not printable because it does not have a yield stress and it does not have thixotropy. These are all engineered using a small amount of nanoclay in the binder. And the nanoclay itself doesn't participate. It's anyway present in very small quantity. It doesn't really influence the reaction or the reactivity of the system. So I still get my strength that I want by, by adding silica into the system. So with that now, so in the previous um, case, the silica was the villain of the piece because it was not giving me the thixotropy. It was an essential villain because I needed that to control the strength. But there's a lot of talk of nanosilica. Now we're talking about nanosilica. You, we've, we've heard of microsilica. It's used as a matrix densifier. And of course, we added uh, in, uh, for durability uh, control. We added to cement paste systems in small quantities in order to densify the matrix, get better chloride penetration, um, improve on the chloride penetration. Um, and so it is a value added commodity. Now, one of the things that we are working on at IIT Hyderabad is you looking at fly ash as a source for nanosilica. Can we do extraction of nanosilica from fly ash? And this is done through uh, base leaching. We've developed processes that allow us to extract nanosilica. And we do it in a way that after we extract uh, nanosilica from the fly ash, whatever is left behind is sand. So basically, I can still use it as fine aggregate. So I, I gain in, on two fronts. I take fly ash. I give you nanosilica, which you can use as a modifier, um, as, a, as, a, as a matrix modifier or as a strength enhancer. And I give you uh, what remains can be used as fine aggregate because basically it's all inert material from which I've already extracted all the reactive stuff. So um, this started about uh, 10 years back when we basically collected fly ash from uh, close to 50 sources. I'm showing you only about seven or eight here. And we found that the oxide compositions, is typical of what you get from an XRF uh, evaluation, the oxides of the fly ash, they look pretty close to each other. That is, typically most of our fly ashes from north and south of the country, they have about 50, 55% of uh, silica, about uh, 20 to 30% of alumina, and of course they're very low in, in um, uh, calcium. This is very, very typical of an Indian fly ash, except for a few which are uh, higher in uh, this thing, uh, calcium. And most of them meet our codal requirement. Now, what we are interested in is in this specific thing, the, the, the xenospheres, the, the reactive silica. That's locked in these nice glass spheres that are present in there. Of course, you may also get plerospheres where one big sphere contains smaller spheres. Um, and just to give you an idea that to capture that photo of uh, plerospheres, we probably had to uh, image about 100 samples and we were lucky enough to find one of those. So um, what we want is to extract these guys out. We want to leach out silica from here and of course, then we also wanted to see what is left behind. So this is a typical, uh, this is what we found out from the XRD analysis. So we've done quantitative XRD analysis of the fly ash and we find that most of the fly ash is crystalline. It contains silica and alumina in crystalline forms. And quartz, which is a pure form of silica, it's SiO2, um, is also present in fly ash. And the predominant form of silica present in fly ash is in quartz. Now, um, so if you look at the XRD, X-ray diffractogram, the black line shows the overall XRD diffractogram. You see this hump there. And the hump goes from a two theta angle of about 20 to 30 degrees. That is the business end. That is the reactive part of silica. That is the glassy spheres. That is the reactive silica that is present in the fly ash. 
So we've done decomposition of this uh, overall signature, and we find that our, uh, the glassy portion, which is the orange line below, that is what I need to leach out. If I can leach that out, I have extracted my silica. So what's left behind? What's left behind is quartz, malite, and basically all inert material, and quartz is sand. So basically, uh, and quartz is predominantly what's left behind. So what I'm doing is I'm taking fly ash, leaching out nan uh, silica, which I can give you in a nano silica form, highly reactive silica. And what I'm leaving behind is sand, which you can use as fine aggregate. So win-win. That's what we worked on. And just I wanted to show you this. This is a, 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 a histogram that we presented to um, NTPC when they were very proud that we're producing good fly ash. So the uh, blue lines are the total silica content that you would get from XRF analysis. The green line is the business part of it. Is what is the reactive silica that you're getting from your fly ash? You see the difference, it's night and day. That is, you could be getting a fly, or in fact, if you look at the total silica content, it's almost 50% across the board. But if you look at the reactive silica content, the green lines is all over the place. And so, when you are buying your PPC or PSC, and the cement manufacturer does not classify that fly ash, you could end up with something that is shown in this red, red box here, with very low reactivity, and then you wonder why the cement is not performing well. So, fly ash needs to be characterized, but there's enough juice in it that we can extract good stuff out of it and leave the rest that is still useful. And this is what we've done. So, we've done the alkaline leaching, we've developed the whole process for leaching uh, this thing, uh, silica from there. We've extracted the nano silica, this is a TEM, TEM image, and the um, EDAX uh, analysis that shows that we are extracting pure silica from there. The residue basically is a fine powder, which is essentially quartz and malite, these are inert grains, which I can use for particle packing. And I need particle packing when I start getting into things like printing. I need fine powders, so I could use this as my powder part. So I'm basically, it's a win-win. I get powders that I can use for packing, which I go use for making, even uh, concretes like SEC need fine fines, and I could use this as fines. And I give you reactive silica that you could ask, act, uh, use as a matrix uh, densifier. So we did this simple experiment where we went back to this alkali activated uh, fly ash slag combination. So the control is where I take fly ash and slag and to that I add sodium hydroxide. This is one way of alkali activating fly ash and slag. We simply take a blend of 50-50 of fly ash and slag, add sodium hydroxide to it. And so the blue lines show you how the strength of that control mixture changes with time. The other thing we did was we take the same fly ash, we pre-leach it, we separate the two components and then we blend it with slag. And you see that now I get a much higher strength. I get almost a, a 30, 40% improvement in strength with this extracted silica because now the silica is in a very reactive form. It reacts much faster and what we found is that I form more geopolymers in the system. This time it is geopolymers because there's more NASH that was formed in the system, sodium aluminum silicate. And we found that the NASH more than doubles in the system. So using this uh, um, fly ash leached silica, we are able to make the system more reactive, produce higher strengths, and uh, of course also produce material that is useful as a filler. So the last part of the talk I want to talk about, CNTs. A lot of people are working in carbon nanotubes. These are basically uh, tubes of uh, uh, carbon. You can have multi-wall, single-wall nanotubes. Now one of the key things about use of CNTs is dispersion. If you are to use the carbon nanotubes, because they have a very high surface area, they tend to stick together. And uh, if you don't disperse them, you might as well not use them. And the key, the challenge there is to disperse. And a lot of people have tried different things to disperse. We've developed procedures to disperse this fly ash. Of course, you need a surfactant. You need to get the uh, CNT tubes to separate from each other. And you also need to put in energy, energy in the form of ultrasonication. So we've basically developed procedures that allow us to uh, ultrasonicate it. So you see the glass beaker that has that is water plus a uh, super plasticizer, a polycarboxylate ether based super plasticizer, to which we've added CNT. So CNT simply sit on top, they float on top like this black gunk that you see. It doesn't mix. The minute you ultrasonicate it, you see that it turns into like a blackish ink. That's when the, the CNTs have completely dispersed in the medium. And now I can use these uh, for my, uh, for mixing with cement or what have you. I've, I'm giving it to you in a nice dispersed state in a liquid form. And um, basically we studied the dispersion of this uh, using UV VIS spectroscopy just to assure ourselves that they are indeed dispersed. Here's a SEM analysis of before and after sonication. Before sonication, you see they're all fibers that are clumped together. After sonication, you see that they completely spread out and all the fibers are completely dispersed in the medium. So we added this to our cement just to see what it would do in terms of enhancing its performance. And what we found is actually the CNTs do enhance the hydration, the kinetics. So the black line that you see is the control, that is cement and water. 
But the minute I add superplasticizer to it, most superplasticizers these days do have some retarders mixed in them, and you see that the action is completely killed. So the control plus superplasticizer is totally pushed to the right. It is totally retarded. But the, when we add this control plus sonicated CNT, when the CNT is nicely dispersed, we see that the peak uh, the peak heat release increases, the kinetics becomes much faster. Actually, the reaction goes faster. The total extent of reaction that you see on your right-hand side, that also increases. That means these are promoting hydration, uh, even in the short term. So CNTs act like seeds around which I'm able to nucleate CSH. And so basically, one, it's acting, it is doing uh, the job of seeding. It's basically acting like a seed around which CSH grows. And the CSH that grows, wraps itself around a CNT, is reinforced at that scale because of the presence of CNT. So it is immediately seen when you measure something like, say, a modulus, dynamic modulus. What we find is that CNT is, when we measure the modulus after one day, we see a 11% gain in uh, uh, modulus. And when you start getting into uh, motors, we start seeing that the gain can be as high as 90%. So this is where we've engineered the material from ground up. And we can start doing things like improving the tensile strength. So there we have studies where we have actually managed to improve the tensile strength by about 70-80% with the use of CNTs, small fraction of CNTs. Um, modulus, certainly we can achieve almost 100% gain in modulus of um, concrete with uh, motors. We've gone up to motor scale with the use of these CNTs. So again, another performance enhancement. I can enhance the performance of concrete specific parameters with a small dosage of this nanomaterial. Now, what are the challenges with this? And I'll conclude with this. One of the biggest things is cost. When you're talking nanomaterials, they're very expensive. And the problem with the, um, uh, uh, they're expensive because they're expensive to fabricate. They're expensive to make. Now, CNTs in particular, if you talk CNTs, and they're very expensive to make using the conventional process. But then there are processes that are being developed where CNTs, uh, we don't, uh, we are following uh, a process where Ethylene gas is used um, and it is basically, CNTs are grown on alumina substrate using um, uh, ethylene gas and it's being produced in a, a kiln type of a reactor process. It's a brand new process that's being developed. If it is successful, then we should be able to make carbon nanotubes at 100 the price of the conventional process. The fluidized bed reactors, the way they are conventionally made, they're very expensive. And uh, this gentleman sitting in the audience here who's basically working on a similar process, uh, Dr. Chandra Shekhar, he's trying to make uh, CNTs using waste material. In fact, on chromium waste, he's trying to grow these nanotubes. So these are all, this is a, a challenge, but there's opportunity. And I think uh, soon we'll have carbon nanotubes available at a fraction of the cost. The other big problem is scale up. Whatever we do with these nano uh, the materials are typically lab scale demonstrations. We need to be able to scale them up to larger scale, whether it is production or um, in terms of demonstration, go to the structural scale, then they become serious uh, competitors um, in, in, uh, in the commercial world. And new binders. So we're talking about, we have to look at other binders too. I mean, uh, they probably in the next 10 years, these alternate binders will probably have a significant share of the market. That means whatever we are developing for cement has also to be developed for these newer binders that are going to come up. So, um, and whatever we do with these additives, manufacture uh, uh, nano additives or anything else, we have to look at cost to benefit ratio. We have to look at life cycle costing. We cannot do look at cost today. If I look at cost today, it's going to be expensive. Nobody is going to touch any of these uh, new technology. What we gain is in the long term, and that is so. I have to figure out ways of measuring the long-term performance, the life of the structure, and figuring out the cost over the life of the structure. Then these, uh, this new technology becomes viable. With that, I'd like to conclude and open the floor for questions if there are any. Hello. Uh, sir, in 3D printed concrete, what was the maximum size of aggregates being used? Yeah. Currently, our limitation is 4 millimeters. And that has to do with the printer, or the, sorry, pump that we have. So um, I'll, I'll tell you the challenge right now. So we are able to pump concrete today, 20 mm aggregate. Um, and we are able to pump concrete to heights of 600 meters. That's available today. The issue there is that I'm pumping large volumes. So these pump pumps that are there commercially cater to large volumes. 
what we need in printing is controlled low volume delivery. I need precise volume at precise time at a small volume. And that's very difficult to do. And so when we're trying to adopt what's already there and basically slow down the process, we get stuck with the aggregate size. So currently, what we're able to do is four millimeters. I think uh, now few people have started printing with 10 millimeters. So slowly we are trying to, as the pumping technology improves, we're able to, um, we'll, we'll go further with the size of the aggregate. Uh, sir, with 4 mm of uh, maximum aggregate size, what strength uh, was there? Strengths we get about uh, 40, 45 MPa. It all depends on the mix design that we have. Okay. And sir, uh, uh, which admixture is there which makes zero slum concrete? Hmm. Zero slum concrete, I mean, let's look at zero slum concrete. Zero slum concrete uh, has existed for a long time. So, um, you must have heard of pavement grade concrete. Yes. Uh, so, if you look at pavements, what is put in specifications is, a, is called a zero slump concrete. So, we've already we've made zero slump concrete. What separates what is required for 3D concrete printing is in addition to the uh, zero slump, what we need is this buildability. That is, I, I deliver a, a material with zero slump, it keeps its shape and it should allow me to stack more layers on top of it. So, I have to engineer the buildability into it in addition to zero slump. So, in terms of achieving uh, this zero slump buildability, it's not just one admixture. I need to play with my admixture. So I need to use um, high range water reducers. In fact, we use mid range water reducers to bring in the fluidity so that I can still pump it. Then we use things like nano clay for getting the buildability. We do use viscosity modifying admixtures because I need the cohesiveness. So it's a whole plethora of admixtures that go in there. And all of these changes, so the minute my aggregate changes, and a lot of uh, uh, aggregate that we use, in fact, is this, uh, we don't get sand any, anymore. It is not in uh, Andhra or in Telangana. So we're all using crushed uh, stone aggregate. And every batch I get is a surprise for me because the fines fraction keep on changing. So every time that happens, now my water reducer dosage changes, VMA, everything has to be changed. Uh, sir, the uh, question is based on dispersion. Uh, in what materials we can disperse uh, uh, using sonication and in what case we can uh, use it uh, sure exfoliation? Ah, so exfoliated, uh, uh, exfoliation is done more for uh, uh, this thing, uh, like uh, um, mount mineralized. Nano clays, they're all usually exfoliated. So they basically intermix it with uh, the uh, organics and then you get these uh, plate-like layers separating out. For CNTs, I think uh, you need to put in some form of energy. So either you use a bath sonicator or a probe type sonicator. You need that energy to get it to disperse uh, in the system. You have to overcome the inherent ability of the uh, this thing, the CNTs to stick to each other. What is the difference between sonication and uh, shear exfoliation, sir? See, shear exfoliation is where you are trying to exfoliate the material by in inducing shear. Here, by in ultrasonication, you are basically just introducing energy by sonicating the whole material. So you are introducing energy where you basically vibrate at a very fast rate, and that is introducing the material and getting it to disperse in the material. Ultimately, at some level, they're both the same, but sonication is more of a local thing that you do, where you basically sonicate everything, and you get the material to be dispersed properly in the medium. Potassium has also been used. In fact, it's as effective, if not more effective than sodium-based products. The issue is cost. Potassium hydroxide is uh, much more expensive than sodium hydroxide. That's why we prefer to use sodium-based products. Small differences are there. Particularly in rheology, there are small differences. Strength, there are small differences. The cation does play a role in the whole process. Um, but the reason why people have not touched potassium-based products is because they're expensive. They're very expensive. Sure. Excuse me, sir. Sir, like, aren't there going to be any voids in the 3D printing? So if there are any voids, how, how can we? Yeah, so that if I do my mix properly, that is, if I have a good mix, I should not have any voids. So it's just like any concrete, right? I mean, if I make concrete and I uh, cast a concrete structure, uh, the, su the surprise that awaits you is only when you remove the formwork. That's, also, that's only the time that you'll know if there are any, any honeycombs. If you've done your concrete mix right, if you've done the compaction well, if you've done the vibration well, you should have no honeycombs. Same logic applies here. If I've done my uh, mixing correct, 
um, which is required for that particular printer geometry because a lot of now that's not standardized yet. I should not have any voids in the mix. How it is connected to the columns on the foundation or something like that because for at this point uh, we are not at that uh, we are not at a point where we can start printing a structure yet. So um, just to take a step back, uh, printing is a technology that has a future. Uh, we are not at the point where we can start printing real structures or we are not even at a point where we are using 3D printing for uh, elements in structural use yet. Because there are challenges, we still have not figured out how to integrate reinforcement into the printed uh, concrete. It's still a big challenge. That being said, it's primarily being used for, at this point, what we do is we do off-site printing. And that is we print it in a factory and then bring it to the site and assemble it. And one of the biggest uses is finding itself in is in um, walls. So I can basically print infill walls. And the advantage I have over on-site construction is I can print a wall of any shape. It is not limited to a rectilinear shape. It need not be a straight line. I can print any curve. So that is the advantage again with this uh, 3D printing. But eventually, yes, uh, people, I mean, we are figuring out ways to introduce reinforcement in there. So some combination of printing and on-site casting is what the future of the technology will be. Uh, thank you, participants. Uh, sir, few, few of them have questions still, but because of time restrictions, we uh, will stop the session, sir, session at this point. I request uh, Sauradeep Gupta, sir, to come and felicitate Professor Kivel, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session, very interactive. We'll be hearing you from, from you very soon. Thank you.